As Edwin Starr wrote, War is good for absolutely nothing. But have some of the most fundamental innovations in how airplanes navigate the Earth gotten their spark from the wars of the 20th century? This is a quick story of something called the Battle of the Beams in World War II, but it's also a story about how modern-day aircraft are able to find their way to distant airports and be guided to a precise touchdown on a runway in even the worst conditions or black of night. In the 1930s, Europe was still at peace. The German national airline Lufthansa was experimenting with new forms of navigating by means of radio signals from ground stations. Radio directional finders were common at the time, which could guide aircraft towards an airport in a city like Berlin, where the newly built Tempelhof Airport was the pride of the Reich. Tempelhof had runways aligned so aircraft would land facing east or west, depending on the prevalent winds. Radio directional finders could guide aircraft to the airport, but in darkness or in poor weather conditions, had no way of aligning the aircraft with the runway for landing. This is where a special antenna was developed to aid in what came to be known as blind landings. The system, called the Wrens, had an antenna with two ends on either side of it, which sent out a steady radio signal to both the left and right side of the runway from the viewpoint of landing aircraft. A switch would activate, alternately short-circuiting one of the beams while the other would continue to broadcast. The switch was timed so that the beam on the right side would stay on longer than the beam on the left. The precise timing of how long the beam would stay on on each side of the runway corresponded to the dots and dashes of Morse code. If an aircraft were flying in the range of the beam on the left, it would receive the dots transmission, which the pilot could listen to. On the right side, the pilot would hear dashes. The antenna was aligned so that these beams would be just barely offset to each side of the runway centerline. There would be a zone of convergence of the two beams right on the centerline. An arriving aircraft would align itself by listening for the dots and dashes. Hearing dots meant an aircraft would need to correct to the right. Hearing dashes meant the aircraft would correct to the left. Being in between, the dots and dashes would converge into a steady tone. This was known as the equisignal. and meant the aircraft was on the runway centerline. The pilot would continue to listen to the signal and make small corrections as necessary. After war broke out and the Germans captured France, they began a campaign of strategic bombing against targets in the United Kingdom. Bombers like the Heinkel 111 were sent in droves from bases all along the long arc of the European coast on the English Channel to attack targets in the UK. Because the Royal Air Force were able to intercept bombers during the daytime, the Germans shifted tactics to night bombing, which prevented RAF fighters from being able to locate them. Problems with navigation and locating targets at night prevented the Luftwaffe from hitting only the largest of cities, though. A form of radio navigation was needed for more precision. This is where the Lorenz system was adapted for wartime use. Through efforts led by German scientist Johann Plendel, the power of the short-range blind landing system was augmented considerably so it could beam a signal across the English Channel into Britain, and its range was concentrated into a very narrow beam. The newly developed antenna was named the Knickebein, German for crooked leg, thanks to its unusual appearance. Just like the Lorenz system at Tempelhof Airport, two focused beams would be transmitted from stations along Nazi-occupied France, like the one in Cherbourg. A dash side and a dot side would converge into an equisignal, which is what bombers would follow. Unlike at Tempelhof, where the beams would always align with the runway, the Knickebein would be realigned to cover a target such as the dockyards at London. In order to allow an aircraft to pinpoint London's location, another signal would be sent out from another station, at Calais. This would be a line to cross over the target. A bomber would leave its airfield in France, fly towards the beam from Cherbourg, and intercept it when receiving the equisignal. It would track towards London, keeping that steady tone of the equisignal. Meanwhile, the crew would be listening for the dots or dashes of the edge of the signals from Calais, alerting them that London was approaching. 
Upon receiving the echo signal from the second beam, the bombs would drop. Often, this bomber would be especially equipped with flares or incendiary bombs to light the target for other bombers who wouldn't need to use such precision navigation. British intelligence was able to learn about Kanikabine thanks to spies within Plendel's operation and the work of physicist R.V. Jones assigned to the Air Ministry. Jones convinced Winston Churchill to authorize a flight using radio equipment to search for a Lorenz-type beam being broadcast over England. Sure enough, the crew found a series of beams converging on the aircraft engine factory at Coventry, and Kanikabine was uncovered. From there, the British had little trouble jamming the signals by setting up false dot beams, which would throw off the bomber's navigation and cause them to be off course or drop their bombs off target. Plendel got to work on a more robust form of radio navigation, which could be used for much more precise targeting. The excurate was similar to the Kanikabine, with the reference signal being beamed from Cherbourg, but was much more focused and difficult to find and jam. Then, a series of not just one, but three beams would be transmitted from the station at Calais. As before, the bomber would intercept the reference signal from Cherbourg inbound to the target. Once closer in, a sophisticated receiver on board would detect the various beams. These beams were given names after major German rivers. The reference signal was the Wesser. Then the three cross beams were the Rhine, Oder, and Elbe in succession. A bomb release point was plotted to allow the bomb to strike the target. The cross beams were aligned such that Elba was 5 kilometers from the bomb release point and Oder was 5 kilometers from Elba, and Rhine was approximately 20 kilometers behind that. A timer was equipped on the aircraft. When the aircraft passed over Rhine and received the equi signal, the two hands on the timer would be set straight up. Passing Oder, both hands would start to move clockwise. Passing Elba, one hand would stop and the other would rotate back counterclockwise. When that hand reached straight up, the bomb would be released. All the aircraft had to do was maintain course and airspeed, and the system would be extremely precise. Excurate was used to devastating effectiveness against cities like Birmingham in a series of raids known as Moonlight Sonata. The vast majority of bombs dropped on Birmingham fell within a few hundred yards of their target, better accuracy than even daytime bombing could achieve. Excurate was harder to jam, so the British eventually countered it by emitting a false Elba signal, which would cause the hands on the onboard timer to stop their clockwise motion too soon, and thus cause the bomb release to occur too early, missing targets. With Excurate gradually being countered, the next innovation in the Battle of the Beams would involve a new component, and it was called Ygurate. Ygurate used the reference signal from Cherbourg as the earlier systems did, but to counteract the jamming or confusion of onboard receivers, messages would be relayed to the air crew via radio from the ground station on the other side of the channel. The ground station would monitor the flight path of the bomber through the use of a transponder, which would receive the signal and immediately transmit it back. The ground station would compare the phase of the received signal to the transmitted one which is an accurate way of measuring the time it takes for the signal to complete a round trip. This provided for both the bearing of the aircraft in relation to the beam, in addition to its distance from the ground station, a combination which provided an accurate position of the aircraft to the ground crew. All the crew had to do was radio instructions to the bombers to correct for the course, and then, at the appropriate time, issue an instruction to release the bombs. The British were ready for y grade almost from day one, it turned out the frequency used by the ground station was almost identical to that used at the BBC's television transmitter at Alexandra Palace in London. R.V. Jones knew that all he had to do was receive that return signal sent from the aircraft and simply retransmit it from Alexandra Palace. This confused the ground stations and caused them to give faulty instructions to the bombers. By this time, the Luftwaffe realized the futility of radio navigation for bombing, and Hitler had turned his attentions to Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Britain's triumph in countering Germany's radio navigation helped save many cities in the Battle of the Beams. Of course, after the war, this technology found peaceful civilian uses again. Stations could be set up on both sides of the channel to direct aircraft across it not to find and bomb targets, but to locate airports for landing passengers and cargo. A ground station, like the one at Lyd, broadcast signals out in not just one direction, but omnidirectionally in all 360 degrees. An aircraft crossing from France can intercept one of these beams which radiate out from the station, called radials, and use its guidance to fly inbound to Lyd. In a nod to the cross-radial innovations of Kanikabine and Excurate, 
aircraft can navigate not just to specific ground stations, but to intersections of two of these radials, allowing them to follow charted navigation routes called airways to their destinations. These airways, along with the ground stations that transmit the beams aircraft follow, are chartered on aviation navigation charts still in use today, and bear a haunting resemblance to the strategic planning of combatant nations during the darkest days of the Battle of Britain. If you enjoyed this bit of aviation history, you might have what's called the flying bug and should have this looked at by a flight instructor at a local flight school who can take you up on an introductory flight lesson. Flight Insight is a training company making videos just like this one that will guide you through all the knowledge and theory you need to gain in order to be a great pilot. You can explore our courses and more at flight-insight.com. Hope to see you in the air.